Welcome kids to a brief lecture about writing and balancing chemical equations. Uh, this lecture is going to consist of two parts. Um, part one, I'm going to talk a little bit about the test and a little bit about chemical equations and formulas used. And then part two, we'll go into more about balancing chemical, chemical equations. So just to start, um, a lot of you said that elements um, are the natural elements that occur on the periodic table. And that's true to a point. The first 94 elements are actually natural elements that occur in nature, but the rest of them are actually man-made. And a lot of them, um, as you can see on this periodic table here, um, haven't even been named yet. Also, a precipitate in chemistry uh, can be a verb. Um, it's to cause a substance to be deposited in solid form from a solution, or as a noun, it's the actual insoluble compound or solid formed by reacting two aqueous salts or compounds in solution. Okay, You'll need this information for the next lab. We're doing an aqueous solutions lab where we're going to build a solubility table. So you really need to understand this word and know it for the next labs. Okay, I also have here listed um, the things that I consider to be elements. Um, these are from the test. You guys can look at your test and double check that you got these right. So if you said anything else was an element, then you were wrong. So for example, if any of you on the test put an E next to milk and said that milk was an element, I'm a little upset by that. Um, I'm not really sure what else to say except for the fact that, you know, milk is obviously a mixture or a compound. So I'm surprised that anyone said that milk was an element. Um, the periodic table is up on my wall. So you guys, and you guys, I never said that you couldn't look at it or, or get up and check it out. And um, so oxygen, silicon, phosphorus, and gold are all elements on the periodic table. Whereas these compounds, rubber, motor oil, battery acid, water, and carbon dioxide, um, water and carbon dioxide are not elements either. None of these are on the periodic table either. Okay, I just want to clarify that. Um, water, I can understand where people might have thought that water was an element because, you know, people talk about the elements as being water, air, wind, and fire, but it's not an element as we understand it in chemistry. And finally, these are mixtures. Milk, raisin bran, soda, air, salt water, granite, and drain cleaner. All of these, you can actually use physical means to separate them very easily. Like salt water, you would evaporate the water and get the salt back. Milk, if you shake it, you can get butter fat out of milk. Raisin bran, obviously, you could just pick out the raisins from the bran, um, and so on. So, guys, just be thinking about these as we continue on. You're, you're not going to see these again. I want you to get these answers right on the test for, for your resubmit this week. But um, past that, you guys just need to understand this stuff as we continue forward in chemistry. Okay? And another piece. Um, measurements. A lot of you guys were still picking the wrong answers. So... This little demonstration right here is just a brief um, demonstration of three questions that you guys came across. So the close-up view of this measurement. Okay, this is a drawing that shows um, someone that measured something about 43. Okay, this cylinder is marked every one milliliter. Okay, the measurement reads 43.0. The measurement reads 43.0 because the marks on that, I can't actually mouse over it, but the marks on that... Um, are to every one mil, and so if they're to every one mil, you can estimate in between and say to the tenths place, okay? So for those of you that, that read a question that said um, a student marks, uh, reads a graduated cylinder that says 34.0, and that's the measurement she writes, draw the cylinder, a lot of you said that it was marked to the one mil and tenths, and that's not correct, okay? Hopefully that is clear by this picture, okay? This is also recorded to three sig figs. Because if it's a zero after the decimal place and at the end of a number, it's significant. It's saying that she was able to estimate out to the tenths place. Okay, hopefully you guys um, keep working with this. Again, uh, I believe in the last lecture I said that you'll be responsible for three sig figs on all measurements. So keep that in mind as you go forward. So two of the bonus questions that I am wanted to show you guys is... Uh, the question, what is the formula for this chemical? And that's calcium oxide. Now, after the lecture, you guys can... Um, hopefully know that calcium has a plus two charge and oxygen has a negative two charge. And so the formula is CaO. Okay. Um, definitely a trick question because we hadn't covered it yet, but it's a bonus questions. So you guys can expect that bonus questions are going to have um, something from future topics just to see if you guys know any of it yet. Um, a couple people on the next question, um, on the next bonus question, sodium hydroxide plus hydrochloric acid yields what? A couple of you had it right. 
Okay, you said that it produced water and a salt, water and NaCl. Okay, that's actually kind of a double replacement reaction where the ions switch places, okay? So I'm asking you guys again, what are the products of this equation? Because we're going to be getting into being able to predict the products of a, of a reaction, okay? Before we go into talking about the writing and balancing of chemical equations, I want you guys to look at states of matter and what uh, states of matter different things have at room temperature. Okay, we want to assume that we're talking about everything at room temperature, which is around 22 Celsius or 72 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay, I'm going to show you guys a little video in a second, but first I want you guys to pause and write these down. Okay, um, past that, you guys are going to fill in um, what you think ionic, covalent elements are, uh, what states of matter they're at. So how do you know what the state of matter is of an ionic compound? Now remember, an ionic compound is a bond between a metal and a nonmetal. Well, I happen to have some here. If you look down here, sodium hydrogen carbonate, NaHCO3, metal to nonmetals, uh, looks like it's a solid. If we move over here to ammonium chloride, ammonium chloride, it's sort of a, it's not really, it's a cation to an anion, it's still ionic. Uh, guess what? Uh, that'd be a solid. If we run over here to copper chloride, oh, nice pretty blue stuff, right? Uh, metal to nonmetal, uh, that would be... A, a solid. solid. Yeah, and we go to calcium chloride, that's a metal to nonmetal. Looks like it's a solid. Looks like it's a solid. Guess what, guys? And we go to sodium chloride, solid. We go to aluminum sulfate, solid. Guess what? Most ionic compounds at room temperature are solids. In fact, all, not most, all of them are. How do you know if a molecular compound a covalently bonded compound, what state of matter is it? Okay, well I happen to have a container filled with water. Notice water is a liquid at a room temperature. Now not all covalent compounds are liquids, but I have another example over here. If we jump over here, I have hydrogen peroxide, also a clear liquid. Now they're not all liquids, some of them are solids. Actually, here's kind of the general rule of thumb. The higher the molar mass, remember we learned about that in the last unit, the higher the molar mass, the uh, more likely it is to be a solid. The lower the molar mass, the more likely it would be to be a gas, and in between would be a liquid. So, for example, I'm exhaling. <sighs> carbon, <laughs> oh, that blew Mr. Sam's way. Okay, uh, <laughs> I brushed my teeth. Uh, carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide, CO2, carbon and oxygen, both nonmetals, and that's a gas. But CO2 only has a molar mass of. 44, so relatively low. If I take something like sulfur, which is actually S8, its molar mass is 32 times 8, and sulfur is actually a solid, so it depends. So the, it sort of depends with your molecular compounds. There's no hard and fast rule like with ionic compounds. Hey, uh, now I want to talk about is how do you know what is the state of matter of elements? So for example, I happen to have a bunch of pennies in my hands. Well, they're solids. Well, pennies are made of copper. Well, copper is an element on the periodic table. So if you go over here to copper, you'll notice, well, on our, copper, our periodic tables in our room, um, the copper is actually colored black. So guess what? Black stands for solid. Okay? But not all elements are solids. Some are liquids and some are gases. Turns out there's actually only two elements that are liquids at room temperature. At room temperature. Actually, we're only talking about assuming at room temperatures. And the two are mercury. And notice it's colored blue on this periodic table and then bromine, and it's colored blue as well. And of course, gases, guess what? They're colored red. So if you look over at the periodic table, most of the, uh, you've got helium, and all the noble gases are gases, of course, and then nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, chlorine, etc., are also red. There's one other one you should also talk about. Of course, hydrogen is a gas, okay? Those were my favorite flip class teachers, uh, Mr. Bergman and Mr. Sams. Hopefully you guys wrote everything down. Uh, that they talked about because I will be checking whether or not you know uh, if ionic compounds or covalent compounds or elements are solid, liquid, or gas at room temperature. Um, but for right now, I want to share with you just a couple more things in, in this video. Uh, and one is diatomic elements. Um, there are a couple elements. Diatomic means that they're naturally occurring as a pair. Okay, so bromine, for example, Br, you'll almost always see it. You'll, you'll see it when it's just bromine, you'll see it as Br2, okay? Same with iodine, I, you'll see that as I2, okay? So hence diatomic, two atoms. They naturally occur as two atoms, okay? And you also see oxygen as O2, okay? So the way I like to remember this is uh, Brinkelhoff or Brinkelhoff, okay? There are seven diatomic elements, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine, um, hydrogen, oxygen, and fluorine, okay? 
They're also known as the Magic Seven, and I'll draw you guys a little picture in a second to show you, or I'll, I'll outline in a second to show you why it's called the Magic Seven. Just a couple definitions going into writing and balancing chemical equations. Okay, a word equation, as you may understand, um, you know that a word equation in math is, you know, something like, you know, Sally is traveling 50 feet this way and Johnny is traveling 50 feet this way. So how long is it going to be before they meet? Okay, that's a word equation in math. In chemistry, it's a chemical reaction written in words. Okay, so we're going to say, I take this much of a substance and this much of a substance and react them together and they form this. Okay, so then what you also need to know is that a chemical equation is a chemical reaction written with formulas. Okay, so where I would say C2H5OH reacts with O2 to yield blah, blah, blah. Okay, I'm not going to give you guys any examples now. You'll see them shortly. All right. I am also going to take about an equal amount of ethyl, uh, ethyl alcohol and pour it across the tabletop here and... <laughs> now, the ethanol actually burns a blue color. That's what you see at down at the bottom. Uh, the orange, of course, that you see up top here, the yellow that you see up top, uh, comes from uh, lack of oxygen, uh, as well as the impurities they put into the alcohol to help denature it, uh, intentionally make it poisonous, uh, and uh, uh, maybe some other impurities. But notice, already equal amounts, the evaporating dish is still burning, uh, but the table is already putting itself out. The video you just saw is of ethanol being burned in the presence of oxygen, and we know that it forms carbon dioxide and water gas. That's the word equation for this. So let's see what we can do about putting together a chemical equation. We know that ethanol is C2H5OH, and that's a little L there, liquid. And it we put a little plus because it's reacting with oxygen gas. And the little arrow says yields carbon dioxide gas plus water. Okay? That is a very simple combustion reaction. I will talk more about combustion reactions in a minute. Let's take a look at two more examples. This one says solid calcium carbonate is heated and turns into solid calcium oxide and carbon dioxide gas. I'm going to type this out really quickly for you guys. So calcium carbonate is CaCO3. And we know that's a solid because it tells us. And I'm going to fix this. Okay, so it's a solid. So we actually, it says it's heated, so we're going to add heat. I'm going to do a little arrow like this. Oh, it looks awful, but okay. And that yields, so the heat actually is going to be a little triangle underneath here. So I'll um, add a little triangle like this. Okay, this is how we know, this is how we denote heat. Okay, it's a little triangle either under the yield arrow or on top of it. You don't actually have to say heat. Okay, so you can say, you can do it more like this. Oops. Okay, so solid calcium carbonate is heated and turns into calcium oxide. And does that turn into solid calcium oxide? Okay. Plus, what's the other thing that came out? Carbon dioxide gas, so CO2 gas. Okay, that's example number two. Make sure you write that down. Example number three. The word equation says that aqueous silver nitrate reacts with sodium chromate to make solid silver chromate and aqueous sodium nitrate. What you'll see in just a minute is that there are five different types of reactions. This one is what we call a double replacement reaction. Okay, so we're going to start. You can see the first half of the equation. Make sure you take time to write that down. The first half is aqueous silver nitrate, so uh, silver, and nitrate is a polyion that you guys need to memorize. Okay, and it's aqueous. We have the AQ there. Then we also have sodium chromate. Okay, CrO4 is another uh, polyion that you guys need to memorize. So these two react together to form solid silver chromate, right here, silver chromate, and aqueous sodium nitrate. Okay, so that solid silver chromate, that's a precipitate, because we took two 
salts to aqueous solutions, put them together, and got a solid out of it. I wanted to take a second to discuss with you guys the symbols used in equations. You need to write these down, so make sure you pause and write down at least the symbols. You don't have to write down these detailed descriptions of them. I'll talk about them for a little bit, but you need to understand what all of these mean. So the plus um, is read as plus or and, and it's indicating reactants that combine or products that combine on the other side of the arrow, okay, which the arrow means yields or produces. So you're separating the reactants, the things that you react and put together from the products on the other side. Okay, the arrow points in the direction of the change. Okay, then there's parentheses S, which is solid, parentheses L, which is liquid, parentheses G, which is gas. These are written after, uh, <coughs> excuse me, these are written after a symbol or formula to indicate what state, uh, what state of matter that substance is in. Okay, and you'll get that out of word equations or it'll be written there. Okay, um, and aqueous is the same. AQ is uh, something dissolved in water or in a liquid. Okay, a yield arrow with the word acetone above it means that it's taking place in acetone uh, rather than just regular water or just reacting the two reactants together. Um, a little triangle, as I said before, indicates that the reaction must be heated, so we need to add flame or heat in some way. Um, the double-sided arrow down toward the bottom indicates that the reaction is reversible. So just because we put A and B together and get C, mean, it's, it actually means that we can get C and go back to A and B if we, if we want to. NR is no reaction, so it indicates that the two reactants on one side don't react with each other, they don't produce anything in the equation, so that's that. Please pause the video on the next slide and answer these questions. For question number one, please make sure you write the correct formula for the substances as well. Hopefully you kids remember these, the four indicators of the chemical change. We are looking at, specifically in the next lab, we're going to be looking at a precipitate being formed to know that there's been a chemical reaction. But you guys also need to remember that if a gas is released or given off, if light and heat are released, or if there's a color change, then a chemical reaction has occurred. The types of chemical reactions that we're going to be looking at are synthesis, decomposition, single replacement, double replacement, and combustion. If you choose to write these down, make sure that you leave some space to define them. A synthesis reaction is the reaction of at least two substances they form a new, more complex compound. So you take A plus B, and you end up with AB as a new thing. So, for example, photosynthesis takes carbon dioxide and light and water and makes uh, sugar. So that's something more complex than the, the original. Decomposition is where a reaction where one compound breaks down into at least two products. So be where you have AB, and it breaks down into A and B. So I've shown you this before, electrolysis which I showed you electrolysis of water where we took H2O and broke it down into hydrogen gas and oxygen gas. It was where they were they had the little tower thing, if you guys want to go back and watch that. A single replacement reaction, if you want to think about the replacement reactions as dancing, where uh, atoms are boys and girls and are on the dance floor and they do some little switching around and stuff, so somebody comes in and taps them on the shoulder and says, I'd like to dance with them, and they switch. That's kind of how you can look at a single replacement and a double replacement reaction, where atoms of one element take the place of atoms of another element in a compound. So if you're looking at this, Xa plus B leaves Ba plus X. So X has been replaced by B in this equation. Okay, More reactive elements take the place of the less reactive ones. So in other words, the elements that react better with things are more likely to just jump in and push the other one out. They'd much rather get down and groove uh -huh. This is similar to a double replacement reaction where a gas, a solid precipitate, or a molecular compound is formed from the apparent exchange of ions between two compounds. So we have A and X dancing together and B and Y dancing together, and X and Y just kind of decide, yeah, we'd rather dance with the other person. We think they're much more interesting. So you end up with AY and BX. So, you know, when you're writing this, the positive ion must always be listed first, but you guys are going to see 
so many of these double replacement reactions in the next couple days, you'll probably want to throw up. And finally, a combustion reaction is where a compound and oxygen burn. Okay, oxygen is always the reactant and the products will always be carbon dioxide and water. For example, uh, we talked about ethanol, but this example is methane, where methane reacts with oxygen, it just produces CO2 and H2O. Okay, 